Good morning. It's good to see you. I, I, I was here for for that extra hour of sleep, man. I got I got it. I took it. I hope you did too. Uh, and you're energetic, like something new. It happens once a year. Like you guys were mostly on time today. That was awesome. So thank you for that. Uh, but it's it's good to be with you. If you're just joining us, welcome to Redemption Park. My name is Mark. It's my joy to open up God's Word with you to the book of Luke this morning. We're in Luke chapter 4 as we are working our way through the gospel of Luke, just seeing and savoring Jesus, and we'll do that again this morning. Uh, As you're turning there, I'll go ahead and read the first two verses, and then we'll we'll jump into it. So Luke chapter 4, verse 31. Listen carefully. This is God's Word. It says, then he went, he, Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. Amen. Amen. Well, since Jennifer and I first started dating, now we've been married almost 25 years, so I think we were dating, what, 27 years ago? Um... There, there's something that happened when, when we were driving that continued to happen. Uh, last week, I kind of threw my daughters under the bus uh, on driving. Now I'll throw my wife under the bus. Uh, not really, not really. But we were, we, like, the first time it happened, it was quite alarming. In fact, it was alarming every time because we'd be driving down the road, and Jennifer would be in the passenger seat, and I'd just be driving along, minding my own business, and she'd go, watch out, watch out, there's a cop, there's a cop. I'm like, what is wrong with you? God, what? She's like, well, 5-0, 5-0, she would say actually back then. I'm like, woman, what? Now, uh, now I'm nervous. Now I'm, now I, I don't know how to drive. Like, it, it, like to this day, she'll still see a cop and freak. I'm like, well, what, what is this authority flinch that you have with cops? I realized you went to Denver public schools and I went to Littleton public schools. So maybe it's that, maybe it's just a cultural thing, but, uh, th- there is this kind of flinch, I think for a lot of us, uh, whether it's the cop, I, I know pastor Rick was telling me he felt the same way whenever he sees a cop. Anyone else share that here? Anyone, any other spouses scream out like, Hey, there's a cop. Okay. So we have a few, we have, you not alone, Jennifer. Um, but I do think there is a, a, the kind of innate in us, a, an authority flinch. Like, ah, even though like, I think most of us it, it would, it would agree, cops are a good thing. Like cops are good. Like why would we pull back from that? Um, but but I, I think this goes back, uh, certainly goes all the way back to our first parents, Adam and Eve. They had an authority flinch when they're like, no, we don't want to come under your authority. We'll, we'll do it on our own. And so it's in our spiritual DNA. But I, I think it's really, for those of us that are Americans, it's in our cultural DNA as well, right? Like we, we are a, a people who were founded in a, a rebellion against authority, King George, who honestly speaking in the history of kings was not that bad. And we're like, no, we'll do it on our own. We're, we're going to, we're going to, and we're going to go West. And the further West we go, the more uh, autonomy we have, the more freedom we have, the more uh, break away from authority. And now we're, we're in the U S West. And so in, in Colorado, especially like there is just like, Hey, I, I don't want. So, so one of the strange things in church culture that that brings is a resistance to, uh, to being part of being a member of a church. A lot of people will go to church, uh, but, but they don't want to be members because then they feel like, Oh, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want authority. Like that's just part of where we're at. But um, there, there, it's in our cultural DNA. We also, we know that we're at a time in history where um, there's a skepticism towards authority across the board. That's probably higher than ever, right? B- because of uh, our access to news, because of what we know, uh, we, we see abuses and misuses of authority everywhere uh, in every corner of our lives. And so, for example, in a recent poll, 65% of Americans said that uh, political candidates only ran for office to suit their own purposes. So, so you have a public servant uh, running for public service for their own purpose. This is what we believe as Americans. So there's a skepticism towards our politicians. Only 8% of Americans believe that the government is responsive to ordinary Americans. So, so only 8% of us believe, yeah, the government's, it's good. It, it, it sees us. It, it cares for us. So there's a skepticism there. There's a skepticism with our justice system. 
Uh, anytime there's a, a video or a tragedy in some corner of America and it gets thrown up on social media, uh, it, now all law enforcement in every area is there's a pall of suspicion that kind of descends upon them and there's a skepticism there. And there's skepticism of all our institutions, of our public schools, and because we, we know of examples where, where School boards and teachers are, are trying to supplant the authority of parents and, and push their own agenda. And so uh, there's a skepticism with the public institutions. But we don't, need to look, we don't need to look far to find evidences of abused power and authority. Um, we can look at churches. We can look at denominations. We can look at church networks. There's a huge skepticism towards the church. This is why a lot of people uh, have come to this spot in their life where I'm, I'm spiritual but not religious, they'll say. Or they'll say, I, I don't want organized religion. And I understand that. To which I say, well, do you want disorganized religion? Like, I can, I can dress up like a clown if you want. Like, uh, I don't know what that means. But, uh, but yeah, pastors are, are some of the least trusted pe- people in our culture right now. So... I know you're looking at me with skepticism every Sunday. So that, that's just the way it is. Because there are plenty of examples of financial, sexual, emotional, spiritual abuse in the church. And, and some of you have experienced that. And the fact that you're here today is just a, a miracle of, of some grace that you would still be in a place where uh, historically has been a painful spot for you. A lot of people don't come back. A lot of people don't come back. Um, but again, we don't even need to look that far. We can look literally in the home where abuses of power and authority by moms and dads and husbands um, are, are some of your stories as well. People that should be the most trusted people. The people that should be for you the most have wounded you the most. And so that's some of our stories as well. And so it's an understandable response when there is a high degree of skepticism and even a pulling away from those things. I think of Shannon Harris. Shannon Harris was, is the ex-wife to Joshua Harris. Joshua Harris, uh, back in the 90s, wrote the book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, this kind of high priest of the purity movement in Christianity and uh, this pa- patriarchal church, very, uh, in some senses, oppressive. And so she's come out of that. She's written a book. And um, I understand her response. Listen to one thing she said here. She says, any system that enables men to hold authority over women and husbands over their wives is unreasonable and outdated. The practice robs a woman of full personhood. So so given her experience and background, she's like, I I wasn't even a full person in that marriage because I was so oppressed. And then she cast that out to everyone, like, like anyone under uh, submission to anyone really is, is kind of cutting short their personhood. Again, I, I don't agree with it, but I understand where she's coming from. And, and so I'm sympathetic to that. But, but what if authority and power were not inherently bad things, but what if In fact, they were intended by and ordained by God to be good things for flourishing. What what would it take to to actually believe that? Well, well, it it would certainly would take uh, uh, an increased trust, right? It it would would take believing that the the powers and authorities that, that we submit ourselves to were actually working for our good and our flourishing rather for themselves and for their own purposes. That's what it would take. Now, now Luke knows this, and Jesus knows this as well. And so Luke wants to put on display uh, the the good authority that Jesus has. Jesus Jesus has ultimate authority, and he wants to show us that actually when authority is uh, is exercised like Jesus exercised, he becomes a, a kind of model for us in our world, then there is life, there's flourishing, there's joy, there's peace. And so this is what Luke is going to show us here in this passage as he show, he enters, we enter into a day in the life early on of Jesus' ministry. Now it said in verse 32, after he was preaching, they were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. 
So, so there's the word. It's going to be come up several, several times in, the, in our passage, the authority of Jesus. And so we ask the question, what, what, what does that look like? What, what does it mean that his words had authority? Is it just because he spoke with clarity and conviction and compassion? Like, is that what it is? Like we've all, maybe, hopefully we've all experienced that. In a, in a good way through coaches or teachers, someone that just speaks very persuasively. And cl- like, like, is that what Luke means? Well, I think partly, but, but that's not quite what he means. Well, what does it mean that he, had, he spoke with authority? Maybe, maybe it's the content of his message. Like Jesus came with some, some, some radical new ideas. He came talking about the, the grace of God and the kingdom of God. And, and maybe that's where he talks so differently than all the other religious leaders. Maybe that's where his authority was. And, and again, I think that's part of it, but that's not what Luke is getting at here either. In fact, Luke's going to answer the question, what does it look like that Jesus words had authority. And what can we learn about authority in our world and in our life and in our faith as a result? Well, let's keep going then. Verse 33. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice. And now just think for a moment how how alarming that would be if all of a sudden Sandy in the second row screams out in the middle of my sermon, <coughs> demon possessed. That's a, that's a, that's a sermon that you're going to, sorry, I just don't mean to throw you under the bus. I'm just saying, if you were demon possessed and you scream out at the top, like we will all remember this service for the rest of our lives. Remember that day when Sandy was demon possessed and she screamed out at the top of her lungs. Like it's, a, it's unsettling at the very least. So, so here they're in, they're in their worship service and the, this demon possessed man screams out at the top of his lungs. Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And everyone's like, well, what is going on? Well, what is happening? Well, in this moment, now it's not just a question of Jesus' clarity and conviction and compassion and what he's, his content about the kingdom of God. Now it's going to be a question, okay, is this going to be a spiritual showdown between good and evil? Like in that time, there were itinerant exorcists. They would travel around uh, when they'd hear stories of demon-possessed people, and they would have these elaborate rituals and incantations and long, drawn-out drawn out things that would cost the, the family members a lot of money to, to come and, and get their, their, their son or daughter or brother and sister delivered from this de- demonic possession. And they're like, okay, this is going to happen here. This is what they're thinking, Right? Now, you might be thinking, because you live in Parker, Colorado in 2023, you're like, that's, I don't know if I can believe in that part of the Bible, demon possession. Isn't that just mental illness or, or something like that? Well, in, in a lot of the world today and, and throughout church history, there, there, is, um, there is a lot of examples and evidences of demonic possession. I, I fully believe that it is present. Paul will say that our, our battle isn't against flesh and blood, but against the, the spirits, the principalities, the dark forces in this world. I believe there is a, a, a spiritual warfare going on even now in this room. It just doesn't manifest itself in the same way. I believe that because living 10 years in Southeast Asia, there are at least, at least three explicit occasions where, where I encountered the demonic manifestations uh, in the spiritual world. Like, and that was just a normal occurrence in some parts of the world. Well, this was a normal occurrence here. And, and so there's this question and there's this idea in people's minds uh, of this battle between good and evil, this kind of dualism. And so, Jesus, do you really have authority? Do your words really have authority? And so here's how Jesus responds. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all, and he came out without injuring him. Notice there's no dualism here. There's no showdown here. There's no like, oh, can Jesus, can he, can he confront the, the dark forces? No, he's just like, stop it. Knock it off. And now all, the people, all of a sudden the people see, oh, this cat is different. His words have authority. In fact, that's what they said. All the people were amazed and said to each other, what words these are with authority. 
and power, he gives orders to impure spirits and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. They see that, that this guy speaks a word and things change. And this has always, always been the case with Jesus. Co-creator of the cosmos. Hebrews 11.3, we believe by faith that, that God commanded, God spoke, and the universe came to existence. That which is visible came from that which was invisible. Jesus speaks and things change. This is what Luke means when he says, oh, Jesus had spoke with authority. Whenever and wherever Jesus speaks, everything changes. Everything changes. But again, Luke isn't just trying to show us that Jesus' words have authority and power. He's trying to show us something about the character and nature of what good authority looks like. Because here's, here's the deal. And there might be some people in this room that share this. For, for some people, the stumbling block to faith is, man, I, I just don't know if Jesus was real and the miracles were real. Did he really die? And, and was, was he really ro- rose again? I, I get that. The Bible is sympathetic to that. Jesus is sympathetic to that. He actually is very compassionate with people that are wrestling with doubt. But then there's another group of people that would not call themselves followers of Jesus, and yet they believe in Jesus. They believe that he was the son of God. They believe he lived a perfect life. Maybe maybe it's you. Maybe you believe that he died on a cross, that he actually rose again from the grave on the third day, conquering sin, death, and the devil. They believe all of that, and yet they don't when it, when you get down to it, they don't you you don't trust the goodness of Jesus. You, you don't trust that Jesus really wants to exercise his authority for your good for your flourishing, for your life. You think Jesus is going to tell you, hey, stop sinning, that thing that you really love, stop sinning, and then follow me. And to be clear, Jesus is going to tell you that. He is going to command you to turn from your sin and to follow him. But it's not because he wants to rob you of joy and life. He he knows that what's robbing you of joy and life is your sin that will lead you to destruction. And so he calls you away from that and he has your eternal joy in place. You just don't believe that. You just don't trust that he actually knows better than you. So it's a matter of authority. You don't want to come under his authority. It's a matter of trusting that he has good authority. And so Luke goes on to show us the kind of authority Jesus exercises. Verse 38, Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. So that's Peter. Uh, If you go to our Israel trip, if it ever goes, uh, you'll you'll probably go to Capernaum. Is that right? Yeah. So, So... uh, archaeologists believe from the end of the first century, this home was identified uh, next to the Sea of Galilee. And so most likely it is the actual home of, of Peter and his household. It's probably the place, the home base of Jesus at this time in his ministry. He probably lived with them. And if you, I saw an aerial view of it today or, or this week, uh, it's right by the sea. And then about maybe 40 yards uh, is the synagogue. And, and the synagogue that stands there now is from the end of the fourth century, but it was built on the place of the original synagogue in the first century. And so Jesus leaves the synagogue, walks 40 yards to get into his home. Now, Simon's mother-in-law, so Peter is married, uh, and so his wife's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. So so, uh, Capernaum and the Sea of Galilee is about 700 feet below sea level. Uh, It's a a lake, and so it's uh, fresh water. Mosquitoes are a problem, and mosquitoes carry, uh, uh, what's the disease? I'm sorry, malaria. Thank you. Uh, All sorts of diseases, but malaria, which causes high fever, which, uh, again, is deadly in most of the world today, Uh, certainly deadly in the first century there. And so they say she has a high fever. Now, Dr. Luke is writing this, so he gives us extra medical diagnosis details there. And if you've ever had a really high fever, you you know what that feels like. You feel like you're going to die, right? So so they asked Jesus to help her. Rabbi, Rabbi, is there anything you can do? We've seen what you've done with the demon possessed, but is there anything you can do here? Verse 39. So he bent over her and he rebuked the fever and it left her. Same word, he, he rebukes a demon earlier. Now, it's one thing to have 
control and power with your words over the, the spiritual forces. But what about just sickness that, that we all suffer from at times? He rebukes that as well. And again, you might be thinking, man, I, I just, that's where I stumble. I can't believe in the supernatural like that. But, but here's the thing. That's a, I, Jesus is actually doing what, what's most natural. But what I mean by that is we live in a fallen world. The world was not designed for, for the, the demonic activity. The world was not de- designed for sin and suffering and disease and death. And so when Jesus comes and he casts out demons and he casts out sickness, he's actually uh, bringing back the goodness of creation. He's, he's bringing back the most natural thing. He's reinstating Eden. He's giving a glimpse to what his mission is. And so he's cast out demons. He's cast out sickness. And it says, she got up at once and began to wait on them. She probably feels better than she's ever felt in her whole life. You're one moment on death's doorstep and the next you feel fully alive. And notice no one had to say, hey, because Jesus saved you, you should probably serve him now. No, no. The natural fruit and overflow of a life of gratitude to Jesus is like, how can I serve the one who has loved me like this? How can I do that? And so she begins to serve them. Verse 40, at sunset, the people brought to Jesus. So sunset. It's synagogue. It's Sabbath day. So on Saturday night, sun sets. People are allowed to travel again. A word has spread, but, but they've all been observing the Sabbath. And now the sun has set, and they're, they're taking their loved ones, their, their sick ones, their demon-possessed ones, and they're, they're coming into Capernaum in droves to find Jesus. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness and laying his hands on each one of them, he healed them. He healed them. He is showing his goodness, the goodness of his authority. Notice Luke is clear. He lays his hands on each one of them. Now, many of these sicknesses and diseases, you weren't allowed to get within 10 feet, let alone touch the people. But God didn't come to stand far off and and condemn us. He came to be with us and and to touch us. And so Jesus, the, 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 the only clean one in the universe, comes and touches the unclean and shows them compassion and mercy. This is who our God is. That, that was one of the tragedies of, uh, of the early days in the COVID experience, especially if you were single, no human contact, and no, uh, no hugs. Like, and some of these people, especially if they had leprosy and others, like it might have been years before they felt any touch. And Jesus, who has all authority, comes and gives them a human touch. Just see the compassion of Jesus. But the other thing you should notice is uh, about what good authority, how good authority actually functions. It functions for the benefit of those that it is over. So, so think about this. A couple of weeks ago, after Jesus was baptized, he's empowered by the Holy Spirit. He is led into the wilderness. He fasts for 40 days. And at the end of 40 days, in, at the beginning of our chapter, in verse 2, it says that he was hungry. And so what's the first temptation that Satan brings to him? If you really are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Use your power and your authority for your benefit. What's the harm in that, Jesus? But he doesn't. He doesn't. Because power and authority is for others. Power and authority are actually inherently good things when exercised like Jesus exercised. And so now he is using his power and authority. He's casting out demons. He's touching sick sick people. He's healing them. But make no mistake about it, he is king, and he is the one in control of everything. Look at verse 41. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, you are the son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. Now, a couple of things to note here. Uh, the people, the, the pe- not the people, the uh, Those that have the best theology in this whole passage are the demon-possessed. 
They, they notice what they say. You're the Holy One of God. You're the Son of God. You're the Messiah. The people that he's touching and healing and, and teaching, they don't even know that about him yet. They'll come, some of them will come to uh, believe that, but most of them don't know it. The, the demon's theology is impeccable. This is why salvation has never been just about knowing the right things, checking the right doctrinal boxes. It's about relationship. The demons know the truth. They don't trust in Jesus. They certainly don't turn and try to uh, serve him and, and be in relationship with him. They are impeccable in their theology. So, so, so they, they need to come to trust Jesus. But, but the other thing I want you to see is Jesus is the one in control. He would not allow them to speak these things. Even though they are saying exactly true things about his nature, he controls the narrative. He says, I will, I, I will proclaim these truths in my time, in my way, not in your way. I control the narrative. He controls the narrative of all of our lives, by the way. He is the king. Then verse 42, at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. So, so we know that the, the busier things got in Jesus' life, the more hectic, the more he just had to find time to get away to pray and to be with his God. So sometimes with his father. Sometimes it was in the morning, like in this case. Sometimes it's late at night. Sometimes he just needed to get away and connect with his heavenly father. And this is what he's doing. It says the people were looking for him. And when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving This is the opposite problem that Jesus had last week in Nazareth. Remember in Nazareth, they were so angry with him. They took him outside the town. They were going to throw him off the cliff to kill him. And he's like, no, that's not my time. I'm the one in control. And now it's the opposite problem. We love you so much, Jesus. We're going to keep you for ourselves. I mean, that's a good problem to have. Right? Like, he, he's rocking it at this point. Things, ministry is booming, right? Things are going well. I mean, he's, he's Joel Osteen at this point, right? Is that, is that too much? Or you don't know about Osteen? Okay. Like, he's a rock star. <laughs> i tell you what. Like, so Redemption Parker's six and a half years old. I have no desire or longing to ever plant another church. But Jesus is like, I got, I got other stuff to do. Thanks for it. Thanks for liking me so much. But again, even, the, even your love for me does not control the narrative. My father controls the nar- narrative. He is also a man under authority. Look at verse 43. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the town, other towns also. Because that is why I was sent. I was sent. By who? I was sent by the father. John's gospel tells us all the time that Jesus says, whatever the Father is doing, I do. I, I do the will of the Father. Here's authority under authority. And so that's what he does. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. He is the model of good power and authority. Imagine if all those institutions, all those other things that I mentioned earlier, if they actually worked in the way God intended for the flourishing of the people, right? What are, what are some takeaways we can take from this as we come from this passage? Well, the question is, how, how then should we live? Well, we should watch how Jesus uses his authority for our good. We're going to see this throughout the gospel. Luke wants us to to know and and begin now in our lives, wherever you're at in your life, begin now uh, growing in your trust in the goodness of Jesus. Do do you trust that Jesus is for you and, and is not against you, his, his, good, his goodness is for you. Do you really believe that down to the core of your being? If you really believe that, then when life hits, you'll still have that. Because here's what Luke knows. Luke is writing this toward the end of the first century. Luke has been on journeys with the Apostle Paul on missionary journeys. They've been imprisoned. They've been beaten. They know of martyrs who have lost their lives like Jesus' brother James because of his following of Jesus. Luke knows that Jesus is going to come and say some very difficult things like Luke 9, 23. If anyone would come after me, if anyone would be my disciple, he must take up his cross and follow me daily. None of us are going to do that if we don't believe 
that Jesus is ultimately for our good and he's ultimately in control. So Luke wants us to trust not just in his power and authority, but in his goodness. So so my question for you is, where do you have a hard time trusting in the goodness of Jesus right now in your life? Where do you think Jesus is holding out on you? Where do you think if you, if you followed Jesus instead of your way, you, you would be less satisfied with life? Maybe it's in one of your relationships. Maybe it's in the way that you handle money. And Jesus is always going to be talking about money because he wants your heart, not your money, but you, it's something that's going to wrestle with you all the time. Maybe it's in your calling in life. I feel like Jesus is calling me to this, but I just don't know. I feel afraid. Do you really believe in the goodness of Jesus? Do you believe in the authority and the power of Jesus? Where is it? So that's the first thing. We should watch how Jesus uses his authority for our good. We, this is number two, we as the people of God should work to reform and restore good authority. Right? Right? Like this is part of our commission. This is the original commission to Adam and Eve is to steward the earth. But now as God's people, we, we, are, we are for the world. We want, we want to see the flourishing of the whole world. And so we lean in and we press into where areas are, are, are off. Right? So we're not anarchists. When we see there's a problem with the, the justice system, we don't say defund the police. And at the same time, we, we don't say, hey, support the blue no matter what and turn a blind eye. No, we are God's people. We say, no, this is a good institution. Like, go to any place where, where the justice system has broken down and there is no cops in the neighborhood. You don't want to be there. Like, there's not flourishing in that place. There's not flourishing in that country. But as God's people, we press into the darkness and we say, no, this is good. We want good institutions. We want good government. We want good schools. We want good... Uh, all the institutions God has instituted, which brings me to the third one. How now shall we live? We should use whatever power and authority we've been given for the flourishing of others. So, so this is again, the original creation mandate to Adam and Eve is you are to have dominion and that dominion should be exercised in such a way that the world flourishes. Now you have All of us here in some degree probably have power and authority and influence over some people's lives. It was given to you, not for you, but for them. That's what we we need to understand. It was given for you, not, not, not for you, but for them. This is the example of Jesus, right? So, so uh, I think of that movie, the last emperor, it's about the, the last emperor of China. This young Chinese prince uh, is, is going to be emperor one day. And his brothers come and visit him. And they're just marveling at the opulence of the palace and, and marveling at his life. And, and one of the brothers says, well, what happens when you do something wrong? And the young prince says, when I do something wrong, someone else gets punished. And he breaks a vase. And later in the movie, you see someone being beaten for the broken vase in his place. Jesus is the opposite. In the movie, the the prince sins and the servants pay the punishment. In Jesus, the servants sin and Jesus takes the punishment because he's good. He goes to the cross. This is good authority. This is our model. This is how we exercise. So, So parents, you are your children's authority. They're not your equals. God has entrusted them to you to shepherd their hearts, to point them to Jesus, to disciple them, to to do all of those things for their flourishing and for their benefit and for their joy. They don't exist to serve your ego or to make much of you. You exist and have authority to serve them. Well, let's talk about a, a sticky one where the Bible will say, wives, submit to your husbands. In the two uh, clearest cases in the New Testament where that is taught, Ephesians chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 3. Notice what it says to the ones in authority. Husbands, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church who gave himself up for her. So there's a picture of good authority. 
Husbands, fathers, in your home, are your children flourishing? Uh, is your wife flourishing? Is there an atmosphere of life and, and giving in there? Do you go to bed tired because you are getting low in the service of your wife and your children? This is what the Bible puts forward as good authority in the home. And so it's understandable when that's not present and the world says, I don't want anything to do with that. This is what we're called to. This is what we're called to. Not just ourselves. This passage also speaks to one last thing I want to speak to. Um, This isn't just about our flourishing. This isn't just about our households. What's actually at stake here in, in this message is the very mission of the church of God. Right? So after Jesus accomplishes salvation, he dies on the cross, buried for three days. After he rises again and appears to to people, some large groups of people and some small groups of people over a period of 40 days. And and at the very end, before he goes to the right hand of the Father, what does Jesus say? Notice the words that he uses. It's called the Great Commission. How does he start? He says, all authority... All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Just as I am the ultimate authority now. So now, no matter what he says after that, that that should be an all play for everybody everywhere because he has all authority. What does he say? All authority has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. This is our mission. Do we believe in the authority of Jesus? Do we believe that it's a good authority? Do we believe it's for our good and for his glory? Then we respond with glad obedience. Go make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey. To come under the authority of Jesus. With everything he's taught. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us, and then we'll hear about our sin campaign this week. Father, thank you for your word to us this morning. Jesus, I pray that you would just remind us of your goodness and your kingship in our life. Lord, we long for a good king. You are that king. Help us to be a people that see you, savor you, and walk in your way. Lord, where there's areas that we don't trust you, Lord, show those to us and help us, Lord, by your spirit to repent and to turn to you in faith because we believe you have our best interests at heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.